This is Regent Review Session 6. This is Ms. Winans, and today's topic is evolution. Every so often there is a mistake in the DNA. Now, mutations are random and they're rare. We have a really good editing system that involves our DNA that when mistakes occur, usually we can fix them. But every once in a while mistakes do happen and it can result in either a beneficial, neutral, or harmful mutation. The two types of mutations that you need to know are a point mutation and a frame shift mutation. Sickle cell anemia over here is an example of a point mutation. Point mutations occur when one point in the DNA is changed. So in this case, where we're supposed to have thymine in the DNA, we have adenine. So therefore, if we take a look at this, it'll change the codon, three letters on an amino acid sequence. So where we're supposed to have the codon GAA, we have the codon GUA, which results in a different amino acid. So what happens here is this structure allows for the tube-shaped red blood cell. Whereas if we take a look at this structure due to the mutation, we get the sickle-shaped red blood cell. In this case, it's not a neutral mutation because the amino acid did change. So this is either going to be a beneficial or a harmful mutation. In the case of sickle cell anemia in the United States, it's a harmful mutation because this sickle shape can increase the chances of blood clots and reduces the individual's ability to transport oxygen. But in areas where malaria is very prevalent, Due to the shape of the sickle cell, since malaria is a blood-borne disease transported by mosquitoes, people with sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. So in areas where malaria is pre prevalent, sickle cell anemia is actually a beneficial mutation, but in areas where malaria is not present, sickle cell anemia is a harmful mutation. So that's an example of a point mutation. Okay. It also sometimes is referred to as an inversion because a different base is put in place of another base. Okay. Over in the um, other side, we have what is called a frame shift mutation. So a frame shift mutation is either going to be a deletion where a base is completely removed or an insertion. In this case, what happens is the G that is supposed to be in the DNA for some reason gets deleted. We're supposed to have this amino acid sequence in our um, protein. But if we take a closer look, when we delete that G, it shifts the reading frame. Remember, every three bases on a DNA codes for a codon on an mRNA, which codes for one amino acid. So with the removal of G, all of these bases in terms of counting our codons shifts, and we end up with ATG, AAG, CAC, GT. That's not a codon because it only has two letters. So where we were supposed to have a protein that had one, two, three, four amino acids, we now only have one, two, three. So we shifted the reading frame and created an entirely new protein. 
So again, a point mutation is where one point of the DNA has the wrong base. A frame shift mutation is when a base is either removed or inserted, shifting the reading frame and changing the codons. An adaptation is a beneficial mutation. It's a gene sequence that leads to a protein that leads to a trait that makes an organism better fit for its environment, which means that it increases its likelihood to survive long enough to reproduce. Any structure that allows an organism to have a survival advantage would be considered an adaptation. Adaptations all depend on the environment. One structure could be a beneficial mutation in one environment and a harmful mutation in another. One example is sickle cell anemia in humans. Sickle cell anemia occurs when the red blood cell that's supposed to have this shape experiences a point mutation which causes it to have this shape. So these red blood cells can float along in your blood vessels sim similar to tubes in a lazy river. Whereas these red blood cells could kind of connect with each other and increase the chances of blood clots. People with sickle cell anemia also have difficulty transporting oxygen and that hinders their ability to make energy. However, people with sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. Malaria is a bloodborne disease spread by mosquitoes. The sickle shape of the red blood cell allows uh, does not allow for the carrying of malaria. So people who have sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. So therefore, sickle cell anemia is a beneficial mutation in areas where malaria is pr present because it allows them to survive long enough to reproduce because they're not suffering from malaria. So again, an adaptation is any structure that makes an organism more fit for its environment, which means that it increases its chances of living long enough to reproduce. Comparative anatomy allows us to look at the structure of organisms and notice their similarities. If a organism and another organism have the same structure, but they have kind of changes in the structure, this is probably due to random mutations to the DNA, which resulted in changes in the protein, which resulted in alterations to the structure, which were then selected for through the process of natural selection. So if we look at homologous structures, we know that the prefix homo means same. So this is gonna be made of the same stuff. In this case, we're all made out of bones. So the um, appearance of bones appeared in all of these organisms, the human, the cat, the whale, and the bat. So they must share a common ancestor because they all have bones. And you'll notice they all have similar bones as color-coded on the diagram. But you will see that over time, the length and size and width of these structures changed. That's due to random mutations in the DNA. Then they had to be selected for, picked by the environment, which we call natural selection. So the human has the arm, the cat has the leg, the whale has the fin, the bat has the wing, these all must have originated from a common ancestor. However, they diverged into different environments, and when they diverged into different environments, they were exposed to different environmental pressures, which, ex which uh, selected for different traits. An analogous structure is the opposite of a homologous structure. So these all actually have the same function, whereas these structures had different functions, same structure, different function, analogous structure, same function, different structure. So since these organisms are made up of different proteins, completely different proteins, the likelihood that they changed due to random mutations is probably unlikely. What could have happened is that these organisms occupy the same niche, in this case, flying. 
So it's made out of different stuff. However, the ability to fly is associated with all of these organisms. So these organisms do not have a common ancestor, but, well, it would be a very distant common ancestor, um, but they do occupy the same niche. They have the same behavior. All right, so now we are going to talk about the different environmental pressures that are um, added to the environment due to human impact. So we know that environmental pressures are what trigger competition, which cause organisms to fight for natural resources. The ones that have the adaptations in order to survive will survive long enough to reproduce. Those that do not have those structures will either migrate or die. So we've talked about natural environmental pressures, and now we're going to talk about environmental pressures caused by humans. So in this picture over here with our polar bears, okay, we see that the ice is melting due to climate change. So what we're seeing is that polar bears are becoming better swimmers. And the reason why that is happening is because the polar bears are going on these um, icebergs, it's breaking off from the um, glacier way, 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 or the ice sheet way before they can see it. They float off. The polar bears don't even know that they're floating off. And then lo and behold, it starts to melt and they're stuck in the middle of the ocean. So some polar bears are able to jump off the melting iceberg and swim back home. Other polar bears will not make the swim. Um, so it's a beneficial adaptation to be able to swim. Um, so we're actually seeing the ability to swim increasing in polar bear populations. Uh, another way humans have impacted the environment is through habitat destruction, through deforestation. So the organisms that lived in this habitat uh, they need to migrate and they need to compete for a new place to live. And if they don't, they will die and they will not survive long enough to reproduce. A common example of how humans have influenced um, evolution is bacterial resistance. So when we get strep throat, we have a variety of bacteria that um, grow and reproduce in our throat. And we go to the doctor, we say, we, you know, we have a really scratchy throat, they give you the strep test, and then they realize, yes, you do have strep throat, so you take your antibiotics. Um, on your antibiotic prescription bottle, it tells you to make sure that you finish the prescription all the way through, uh, because you are introducing the environmental pressure of an antibiotic, something that's going to kill the bacteria. Now, most antibiotics will kill all varieties of bacteria as long as the resistance strain is in low numbers. If the resistance strain is in high numbers, the problem is, is you have to use a higher dose of antibiotics. So if we take this situation, so Johnny is going to Disney World, he realizes that he's getting sick. He goes to the doctor, he says strep throat, he takes his antibiotics on the first day, they tell him to take double dose. So we kill off varieties of bacteria. Okay, and he takes it for a couple days and he gets ready to board the plane and he gets on the plane and he realizes, oh no, I forgot my antibiotic prescription. So while he's on the flight, he is allowing the bacteria that he selected for by taking antibiotics um, to reproduce. Um, however, we don't have these low resistant levels of bacteria. We have these high resistant level bacteria. And remember I said that most antibiotics will kill all varieties of um, strep throat. However, that's in low levels of bacterial resistance. Um, by the time he's able to get his final dose or his dose of antibiotics, the bacteria have reproduced. And unfortunately for Johnny, it's uh, a resistant population. So now at this point, the original antibiotic does not work. Um, and that was the environmental pressure that we introduced. 
and we now have a much stronger, much nastier version of strep throat, which means they're going to have to take a stronger uh, dose of antibiotics. Now, if somebody around him catches this disease, they're also going to get a strain of strep throat that cannot be combated by normal antibiotics. And this is why we have such a concern with how often antibiotics are prescribed um, to avoid this situation. Um, so Johnny's probably going to have to take an extremely high dose of backed, uh, antibiotics, so which means he's probably not just going to have strep throat. He's going to have a really nasty case of diarrhea. Um, so again, one example of human impact affecting natural selection is bacterial resistance. A very similar example is pesticide resistance. So just like the antibiotics, when we spray um, pesticides, usually the bugs that are not resistant to pesticides are usually the ones that are very prominent in the environment under normal environmental pressures. However, if we introduce a pesticide, which is what we see here, so we're going to spray a pesticide here, you'll notice that the green bugs get wiped out and this red bug is left behind. So, you know, we don't spray pesticides all the time. So now what we might do is we might um, allow them time to reproduce and then we say, oh, there's bugs on our crop again. So then we spray again and lo and behold, what happens is the red bug population um, is not getting killed by the pesticides. So what we see is we see a decrease in these green bugs and an increase in these red bugs. And then what happens is our pesticide completely stops working um, because we have introduced an environmental pressure, which is the pesticide that has selected for these red bugs. And these red bugs can now damage our crops and cannot be killed by pesticides, which what they do is they then introduce a stronger pesticide, which could be dangerous to our health. It, we have to wash our fruits and vegetables. It's not a pretty scene. So the solution that you can do is you can use what is called a natural predator. So instead of using um, pesticides, which some strains or some varieties of bugs are resistant to, you can use a natural pet predator like a spider or the more friendly version, our friend. The ladybug. Because they don't care if a bug is resistant to a pesticide or not. They eat them all. The peppered moth is another example of how humans have introduced environmental pressures. Um, so this is a healthy birch tree away from the city. And you'll notice that you have the peppered moth that can blend in with the birch tree. And you have the black moth, which stands out, making it vulnerable to predators. So it's most likely that the pepper moth will be able to um, survive long enough to reproduce. So that population is going to increase. This black moth is probably going to be susceptible to predators. So it's not going to survive long enough to reproduce. So we're going to see a decrease in the black moth population. Um, if we look at this birch tree that's closer to the city, you'll notice that it has um, ash from pollution, most likely from smokestacks. And they put the dust in the debris and then it settles on the birch tree. So in this case, the black moth is going to be able to blend in. That population is going to live long enough to reproduce and increase, whereas the white moth is now vulnerable to um, predators and that population would probably decrease. So it, it's, again, you got to identify the environmental pressure and pick which adaptation that environmental pressure is selecting for. In elephants, we're noticing that we're seeing more and more elephants born without tusks. Scientists believe that this has something to do with the ivory trade as well as poaching. Um, what happens is elephants are killed for the ivory in their tusks 
and what they are hypothesizing is that the elephants are being born with shorter and shorter tusks because it's an advantage to not have tusks because you won't be killed by poachers. So again, it's the poaching that is the environmental pressure. Those elephants that have the long tusks are not surviving long enough to reproduce. Those elephants that don't have tusks are surviving long enough to reproduce. So due to the ivory trade and poaching, we have introduced the environmental pressure that is selected for elephants that do not have tusks. In our local waters, what we're seeing is that fish are staying smaller sizes. So when you go fishing, um, there is a set requirement. So a fish can only be a certain size for you to pull it out of the water. Um, otherwise, you have to throw it back. Um, and what we're seeing is that the fish themselves are actually getting smaller and smaller. Um, and scientists are hypothesizing that it's due to um, excessive amounts of fishing. Um, because what happens is if you are a fish and you're caught and you're pulled out um, and you do not make the required size, you're thrown back. If you are a fish and you are above the required size, you are brought home and cooked for dinner. Um, so it is beneficial to be a smaller size so the organisms, the fish that are of small size live long enough to reproduce, whereas the fish that grow to larger sides are likely to be caught and do not survive long enough to reproduce. Last but not least, the way that humans have kind of provided evidence for evolution is selective breeding, which is when we select a mate for a given trait. So if we take a look at the picture below, we see wild mustard. Um, we've selected the breeding patterns um, in terms of our agriculture over uh, hundreds of years um, to make many different varieties. So cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, um, and this interesting vegetable um, come from uh, wild mustard. And what we basically did is over time is we selected mates for given traits until we came up with the desired trait that we wanted. We have also done this with different dog breeds. All dogs are the same species, but we have selected mates for a given trait to make a variety of different breeds. We've also done this in many other domesticated animals. So again, selective breeding is when humans have manipulated evolution, also providing evidence for evolution that um, they have selected a mate for a given trait to end up with the desired population.